Hi, this is Lucy Malenke from the James Madison University Writing Center, and this is the second in a two-part video series on writing in an academic style. In the first video, I discussed point of view, active versus passive voice, and information flow. Today, I'm going to focus on some of the language choices that impact the style of your writing. Academic writers must carefully consider objectivity, the strength of their claims, their verb choices, and how to express ideas with concision. In many forms of academic writing, the author is expected to use an objective tone. This does not mean that academic writers can't make claims or express opinions. In fact, successful academic writing usually hinges on the author's ability to effectively support an argument, whether that be an analysis of previous research, recommendations for clinical practice, or the application of a theory. But unlike arguments in more informal kinds of writing, such as reflection papers or opinion pieces, arguments in scientific and research writing tend to rely on empirical evidence and established theories, not personal experience or gut feelings. In most kinds of academic writing, authors should avoid expressions that indicate a personal preference, opinion, or judgment. For example, the sentence, unfortunately, the data did not confirm our hypothesis, is problematic because it includes a personal expression of disappointment, the word unfortunately. A better alternative would be to simply state, the data did not confirm our hypothesis. Word choices can also indicate judgments or personal reactions that undermine the author's objectivity. For instance, the sentence, I felt that they were living in squalor, is problematic for two reasons. First, the author's feelings typically aren't discussed in academic writing. Secondly, the term living in squalor has a negative connotation and implicitly judges the people living in those conditions. A more objective version of the sentence might read, they lacked access to clean water and opportunities to dispose of hazardous wastes. As an academic writer, you're expected to be aware of your own biases and to uphold human dignity by using sensitive and respectful language. The APA style manual gives detailed instructions for writing about topics like race, gender, sexual orientation, and disability. For example, it warns that you should never objectify a person by their disability or medical condition. It is not respectful to call people brain-damaged individuals or to label them AIDS victims, autistics, or wheelchair-bound. The APA recommends using people-first language. So, in the example provided, it would be better to say, the organization serves individuals living with traumatic brain injuries. If you are uncertain about whether your writing conveys bias or lacks objectivity, check your style manual, talk to your professor, or visit the University Writing Center. As an academic writer, you also must exercise caution when making claims. The strength of your claims should match the evidence you've provided. In most cases, you should avoid making broad generalizations, and when appropriate, you should qualify your claims. John Swales and Christine Feek, in their book Academic Writing for Graduate Students, give several methods for moderating or qualifying claims. The first method is to use a modal verb, such as may, might, can, or could, to indicate likelihood. For example, saying that word-of-mouth advertising can influence a customer's incentive to purchase a product indicates that exceptions may exist. Eliminating the word can would increase the strength of that claim, and replacing it with the word might would decrease the strength of that claim. The words appear, seem, and tend have similar softening effects. Saying health education has a positive impact on quality of life is a sweeping generalization. It would be more accurate to say health education appears to have a positive impact on quality of life. You also can directly state an exception or qualification in order to moderate a claim. It would be one thing to claim that all children living in poverty do poorly in school, and quite another to say, with the exception of those enrolled in specialized programs, children living in poverty usually do poorly in school. 
Your choice of verb can also help you strengthen or weaken a claim. For instance, saying the results establish a link between smoking and lung cancer is a stronger, more conclusive claim than the results indicate a link between smoking and lung cancer. Using these techniques will allow you to add nuance and complexity to your ideas, improving your style as an academic writer. The verbs used in academic writing are often different than the verbs we use when we speak or when we communicate informally. As Swales and Feek point out, we tend to use a lot of verb phrases in our everyday speech. Things like put into practice and looking into. However, academic style is characterized by single verbs, so determine would be a better choice than figure out, and develop would sound more academic than come up with. Instead of saying get rid of, an academic writer would probably say eliminate. A thesaurus tool can help you find more academic replacements for verb phrases. Just be sure to double check the definitions of the words you choose. Not all synonyms are interchangeable, and precision is just as important as concision. Concision is an important feature of academic writing overall. In most scientific disciplines, simple, straightforward language is preferred to the complex, descriptive, and figurative language used in many humanities fields. Your writing should convey your ideas in the clearest way possible, with the fewest words possible. So how can you avoid wordiness in your academic writing? A good place to start might be these lists of diminishers, intensifiers, and vague words, which Ken McCrory discusses in his book, The Eye Search Paper. Many of these words can be eliminated without changing the meaning of the sentence, or replaced with a more concise and precise alternative. Check out this wordy sentence. Actually, the situation with healthcare inefficiencies in America is rather complicated to understand, as there are a lot of different aspects to the problem. A much better alternative is possible if we cut the diminishers, intensifiers, and vague words, and clarify a few concepts. The complexity of America's healthcare system makes addressing its inefficiencies difficult. It's not only more concise, but also much clearer. Another easy target for condensing your writing is what Richard Lanham calls slow wind-ups in his book Revising Prose. Take a look at these sentence openers. What I would like to signal here is that, my contention is that, the important fundamental to remember is that, all of these phrases end in is that, and in nearly every case, you'll find that these slow wind-ups can be cut entirely. Not only will your sentences be more concise, but they'll have greater impact. In his book Revising Prose, Richard Lanham also teaches a technique for eliminating wordiness in his sentences. He calls it the paramedic method. I'm going to go over the first four steps of that method with you today. Step one is to circle the prepositions. Step two is to circle the is forms. Next, find the action and then put the action into a simple, not compound, active verb. The goal of the method is to condense prepositional and verb phrases by building sentences around simple, active verbs. Let's give it a try. The first step in the process is to circle the prepositions. That is, words that create relationships between a noun and another word. Prepositions often answer the questions where or when, some common prepositions are the words on, in, at, and to. See if you can identify the prepositions in the highlighted sentence. Did you catch all six prepositions? You might have thought there were seven, but the to in front of the word suggest is part of the infinitive verb to suggest. Sentences with lots of prepositional phrases tend to be wordier than necessary. The next step is to circle the is forms. Lots of wordy sentences are built around forms of the verb to be. 
Do you see any here? Yep, there is one is in this sentence. The next step is to find the action, and that action may be hidden. So you'll need to ask, what's really happening here? Who is doing what? Are there any non-is verbs in the sentence? Or are there any verbs disguising as other parts of speech? I notice one non-is verb, exists. So we know, according to this sentence, that gender inequality exists. But we also see from the infinitive verb to suggest that something else is happening here. Who or what is doing the suggesting? Evidence. And with that observation, we've already initiated step four. Put the action into a simple active verb. So, beginning with evidence suggests and thinking about what exists, we get the much clearer and more concise revision. Evidence suggests that gender inequality exists in schools. Getting a hang of the paramedic method takes some practice, but it's an incredibly useful tool for condensing sentences. If you'd like to see the full method, I recommend checking out the book Revising Prose. You can also read more about the paramedic method in the University Writing Center's online link library. Just check out the Writing Concisely section. I hope this video has helped you feel more comfortable with the language choices you'll have to make as an academic writer. Good luck with your writing projects!